Today I'm going to be discussing the Vonich Manuscript, which is certainly one of the most interesting and has been called the most mysterious manuscript in the world. I will describe the physical manuscript, place it in a historical context, and then discuss my own ideas about the people who may have been uh, its authors. First of all, the manuscript itself is written in a language of which no other example is known to exist. It is a alphabetic script, but of an alphabet variously reckoned to have from 19 to 28 letters, none of which bearing any relationship to any uh, English or European letter system. The manuscript is small, 7 by 10 inches, but thick nearly 170 pages, closely written in a free-running hand, copiously illustrated with bizarre line drawings that have been watercolored, drawings of plants, drawings of little naked ladies uh, appearing to take showers in a strange system of plumbing, which has been variously identified as organs of the body or a primitive set of fountains, and astrological drawings or what have been interpreted as astrological drawings. But more about all this later. First of all, the known facts of the manuscript are uh, few. They are that it appears in 1586 at the court of Rudolf II of Bavaria, who was one of the most eccentric uh, European monarchs of that or any other period. This is the same Frederick who collected dwarf collected, uh, had a regiment of giants in his army. He was surrounded by astrologers. He was fascinated by games and codes and music. He was uh, typical of the occult-oriented Protestant intellectual of this uh, period. Anyway, to his court and among his courtiers came an unknown person who sold this manuscript to the king for 300 gold ducats, which translated into modern monetary units is about $14,000, which is an astonishing amount of money to have been paid uh, for a manuscript at that time, and immediately signals that the emperor must have uh, been highly impressed by this object if he was willing to put out that kind of money for it. <clears throat> Accompanying the manuscript, is a letter which states that uh, it is a manuscript of the Englishman Roger Bacon who flourished in the uh, 13th century and who uh, was a noted pre-Copernican astronomer. Now, at that time in Prague, which was where the court of, uh, of the emperor was being held, uh, the reputation of Roger Bacon was at a great height. The court was a hotbed of alchemy, and among all these alchemists, the reputation of the English monk Roger Bacon was held very high. This is because uh, two years previously, the sale of the Vonage manuscript to the emperor being uh, dated to 1586, two years previously, John Dee, the great English navigator, astrologer, uh, magician, intelligence agent, occultist. Wait a minute, I still am back on Frederick. You mean what was his relationship to all this? Could you develop him a little bit more? You say it was typical. Well, he was, he epitomized the liberated uh, Northern European prince who was a patron of alchemy, gave money to all these printing presses that were printing all this alchemical literature. Uh, the Rosicrucian conspiracy, about which I will say more later, was fomenting at this very period right under the surface. And... Uh, Frederick patronized astrologers, magicians, alchemists. The reason John Dee uh, had such a long stay at Frederick's court was because his companion, Edward Kelly, claimed to be able to perform the alchemical opus. And the king more or less placed them under house arrest and asked them, you know, to do this for him as a favor since he had patronized them very heavily. And uh, when they were unable to... Uh, D was able to talk his way out of it. Kelly had been the one who had made the major claims, and he was kept there and actually died 
in an effort to escape. He fell when the, he, the shale roofing on a high parapet of this castle slid way underneath his feet one moonlit night when he was trying to sneak out of the castle. Uh, but I anticipate my story because I think John Dee and Edward Kelly are probably... Uh, if they were not the, um, I certainly think they were the people who sold the emperor the Vonich manuscript because of circumstantial evidence uh, surrounding their interest in subjects similar to those being covered by the manuscript. And uh, Frederick, Frederick, is the same one? Is that the Winter Summer Queen, King and Queen? Is that Frederick? No, that this we're talking about Rudolf II. Oh. He was succeeded oh. by this guy, Frederick the Elector Palatine of Bohemia, who was also in this mold as a patron of Protestant uh, alchemical aspirations in Central Europe. But anyway, the Vonich manuscript uh, was accompanied by this letter stating that it was a, a Bacon manuscript and the best astrologers and cryptographers in this court looked at it and could make nothing out of it. And uh, it, and along with a great deal of other weird collections and material that Rudolf had gathered together from all over the world, was uh, passed to various people at his death. And this book, because it contained botanical illustrations, passed to his botanist, who was a man named Marcisi. And uh, he had it for 20 years. Then it passed to an unnamed party who had it for 20 years. And by this time, we're up to the 1620s. And then it passed to Athanasius Kircher, who was one of the great polymaths of the mid... Uh, 17th century. He was a Catholic intellectual, an alchemist, a person who experimented with artificial languages. And before he obtained the Vonich manuscript, we know of letters of his to various people asking about it. And in fact, he was sent small portions of it reproduced that he struggled over. But once he actually had the manuscript in his possession, his diaries are silent about it. And he says nothing even though five years after he acquired it, he published a book called A Universal Study of Artificial Languages that nowhere mentions the Vonich manuscript. Then well, some maybe, maybe, well, he called it something else. But there's no, there's no reference of any sort to anything that he possessed that was like that. That's right. And he became a, decided to become a Jesuit in about 1660 and uh, had to give away all of his worldly goods. So he gave uh, his library to this Jesuit seminary south of Rome. And in among his books was the Vonich Manuscript. And it sat on a shelf in the seminary from 1660, 1760, 1860, 1960, 200 and tw 320 years. No, no. Jeez. 280 years till Alfred Vonich, a New York book dealer, bought the entire library on a trip to Europe in 1912. And when he got it all back to New York and sorted through it, among all this easily cataloged late Renaissance Italian theological material, was this peculiar book, more than peculiar, totally anomalous book. And uh, it's very strange because uh, the store of images, uh, even as late as the period when we first hear of the Vonage manuscript in the 1580s, the store of images in the European mind was very limited. For instance, uh, in speaking of the biological sections of the Vonage manuscript, here you get 120 drawings of plants, and yet there were only 10 or 15 herbals in circulation among the educated people of Europe of that time, and none of the Vonage images can be directly traced to any of these previously uh, printed or circulated manuscripts. Likewise, the script itself, it has no antecedents and it spawned no imitators. Uh, codes from the early 16th century onward were, in Europe, were all derived from a book called the Stenographica of Johannes Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim, who was an alchemist of Sponheim, who was uh, uh, 
wrote on the encipherment of secret messages, and he had th about three methods, and uh, no military or alchemical or religious or political code was composed by any other means throughout a period which lasted well into the 17th century, yet the Vonich manuscript does not appear to have any, uh, any relationship to the Trithemian codes. Uh, as Trithemian codes? The codes derivative of Johannes Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim. Yes. And, uh, is that a, I mean, is there something, do people research the Trithemian codes? Oh, the literature is voluminous <laughs> on the Trithemian codes. <laughs> Sure. Uh, there's a book by Walker called Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Facino to Campanella that covers all of this very well. Or Francis Yates' book, uh, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment. Although they, Did neither you talk of them. Yet? Not quite yet. Okay. First of all, <laughs> let's see. Uh, more about D and why I think that D is the obvious candidate for uh, being the author or being the purveyor, if not the author, of uh, the Vonich manuscript. D, uh, first of all, uh, Trithemius' book, the Stenographica, didn't circulate in, as a printed book until uh, the 1580s, but it circulated in manuscript form from about 1530 onward. And when D visited the continent as a fairly young man, he records in his diary that he spent three days hand copying the relevant chapters of a manuscript copy of the Stenographica that he was shown in Paris. So from very early in his intellectual life, he was in possession of the Trithemian code-making machinery. The next important event in his life for my argument, and one of the most puzzling events in the whole history of science generally, is the afternoon in July of 1582 when at Mortlake in his study, John Dee was distracted by a brilliant light outside his window and stepped outside to receive from a creature he described as the angel Gabriel a uh, polished lens of Lancasterian coal, which he described in his diary from thenceforward as the shoe stone. <laughs> That's S-H-E-W. The shoe stone. And uh, he was able, by meditating on this stone, to induce uh, visions and dialogues with spirits. However, uh, this ability seemed to fade in the months after he received the stone. Intel, a strange personage, came into his life in the spring of uh, 1584, and this was uh, Edward Kelly. Now, Kelly was a much younger man than Dee, and Dee was married to a much younger woman, Anne Dee. Uh, and Kelly was uh, of the uh, rascal class. And he, in fact, in one account is described as being earless, having had his ears removed for some uh, petty crime in the provinces. Anyway, he arrived at Dee's uh, place in Mortlake, pop-eyed and breathless, with a wild story about how he had fallen asleep in a ramsacked tomb in a monastery in Wales, and when he had awakened beneath him in the tomb had been a vial of red powder, which was the transformative elixir, and a book in an undecipherable language, um, which he called the diary, uh, sorry, the Gospel of St. Dunstable, and said that he had been told around in the village that it was in ciphered Welsh. Now, we actually hear no more in anybody's diaries or letters of the Gospel of St. Dunstable. However, Arthur Dee, the son of John Dee, writing some 30 years later and reminiscing about his father, said that from the time he met Kelly, he spent a great deal of time uh, trying to unravel a book called Covered All Over with Hieroglyphics. <laughs> And uh, perhaps this is the diary or the gospel of St. Dunstable, and perhaps it is, in fact, the Vonich manuscript, and that these two things are the same thing. In any case, uh, Kelly's entree to D was the undecipherable manuscript and the alchemical potion. 
and he quickly, uh, from his conversations with Dee, uh, determined the story about the show stone, and they set up a seance situation, and Kelly proved himself to be a very adept scryer of the stone from the very first instance he could describe vast theatrical oh, undertakings uh, and it. speak all the parts the of the characters the oh the show stone is in the british museum it you can see it there it sits they still have it anyway um so then begins a period in Dee's diaries, which have been were published in 1658 by Marie Casabon as a true and faithful relation, uh, a series of diary entries that span the next ten years, dozens, hundreds of spirit conversations, and the delivering unto Dee and Kelly of an angelologic language called Enochian, which was composed of non-English. Uh, letters, but which computer analysis has recently shown has a curious grammatical relationship to English. But over 4,000 words are known in Enochian, and they were transmitted by the ghostly apparitions which Kelly channeled to D and D, and some of the messages were uh, theological in nature, many were political and uh, came to them as they traveled about Europe, including visiting the court of Rudolf II of Bavaria, our man who was sold the Vonich manuscript. And they were the people who were responsible for telling everyone what a great alchemist Roger Bacon, the English monk, had been. They laid the public relations groundwork for turning this manuscript at a high premium, I maintain. In any case, uh, the several groups that have studied the Vonich manuscript have not looked at the amounts of encrypted material in John Dee's diaries, of which there's over 92 pages of strings of numbers and letters, which if it were found to be encoded in the same way that the Vonich material is encoded, um, that would definitely solve the problem of the authorship of the manuscript. The manuscript, uh, which would have had to have been written in the 13th century, if it were by Roger Bacon, is definitely shows all the physical signs of being a 16th century manuscript. I estimate it was done sometime around 1540. And uh, D, this means Kelly perhaps obtained it somewhere, Otherwise, it would have had to have been done later, as late as the early 1580s. If, if D actually wrote it, then, uh, then it should be possible to determine this, because such large amounts of his encrypted, though still undeciphered, material is uh, on record. Uh, and perhaps now would be the moment to talk about the Rosicrucians and show how they uh, work into all this. Dee died an old and broken-hearted man in the under the reign of James I in 1608, many years after the events of the sale of the Vonage manuscript occurred. Why was he broken-hearted? Well, he had been the court astronomer of Elizabeth and the friend of Sir Philip Sidney and the most educated man in England. When James came to power, James had a total horror of the whole magical side of the Elizabethan court, and he just dismissed this guy as a crank. He didn't want astrologers around him. He thought it was all creepy. He was a rationalist. His anti-Catholicism extended to a mistrust of the entire occult tradition generally. However, uh, early in his flowering period, Dee had written a strange book called the Hieroglyphic Mona, the Monus Hieroglyphicum, which was 36 quasi-geometrical theorems, which actually hinted at some kind of mystical doctrine. And it was just, it's this utterly obscure book. Uh, in the early 1580s, it circulated in manuscript and was and who we are, you may not know, but if you're uh, 
hip enough, you'll be contacted and asked to join. And people like Robert Flood, who was essentially the heir of the D tradition in, in English occultism and science, basically put out advertisements saying, if I ain't good enough, nobody's good enough. Why haven't you people contacted me? <laughs> and the fact of the matter is that... Uh, the Rosicrucians, meaning the authors of the Fama and the Confessio, never contacted anybody. And their claim was basically fraudulent. It was that uh, the tomb of Christian Rosencrantz, who had lived in the 14th century, again, it's like this harking back to Roger Bacon, but instead harking back to a mythical personage two centuries previously, that the tomb of Christian Rosencrantz, a, a great knight who had gone on the last crusade, had been discovered, and that inside there were all these alchemical books, and with a quasi-political overtone, definitely favoring the Bohemian uh, court of Frederick the Elector Palatine and uh, that all this should be disseminated as gospel. It was a kind of alchemical Protestant revival. But curiously, these texts, the Fama and the Confessio, had many doctrinal similarities to Dee's hieroglyphic monad so that it appears that Dee either was used as the model for the Rosicrucian conspiracy by its authors persons unnamed, but I suspect the Czech alchemist Johann Valentin Andrei as probably being the person behind this, because Andrei and Michael Meyer were people who uh, uh, definitely were old enough to have been involved in Dee's earlier visits and have then just been at their intellectual, at the peak of their intellectual powers when the... Uh, foment that you mentioned of the Winter Kingdom and the bringing of Frederick Elector and his wife to Prague as uh, the king and queen this episode occurred. And in fact, I'll now relate the Vonich manuscript back to all of that. Previously, I mentioned that when Rudolf King, his court fell into disarray, the Vonich manuscript passed to his botanist. Well, what was happening was that the old emperor was dying at a great age and mad as a damn hatter, no question about it. Meanwhile, to the west, in Bohemia, the Frederick Elector, who is everything a Protestant alchemical prince could hope to be, young, brilliant, scheming, totally in charge of his lords, he weds Elizabeth, the daughter of James I of England, and he takes the king's decision to give him his daughter's hand in marriage as a uh, tacit approval for his plan to establish an alchemical kingdom, a Protestant alchemical kingdom in Central Europe. Actually, uh, James, being the conservative that he was, had a far more uh, Machiavellian purpose in wedding his daughter to Frederick the Elector because he also had it in his mind to wed one of his sons to a Spanish Catholic uh, Habsburg princess and was uh, trying to steer a neutral course when he realized that Frederick and Elizabeth had gone off to, uh, to Bohemia, to their court, to be with Michael Meyer and Gerhard Dorn and Johann Andre and all these guys uh, and to uh, patronize these alchemical presses and astrology and all this stuff. He was much alarmed, but by that time it was too late to call it back and he realized that Frederick the Elector was a wild card. When Rudolf finally did die, the... Uh, princes of the Northern League gathered and chose his success, successor by secret ballot. Frederick won. And so in the winter, in the late fall of 1619, he and Elizabeth transferred their court to Prague and ruled for one winter uh, until May of 1620. Uh, the Mayflower was landing in America in the same year, but uh, it had nothing to do with any of this. Uh, then the Habsburgs by that time had mounted an army and uh, were able to crush 
this thing. In a sense, it can be seen as the opening shot of the Thirty year, Years' War, although the Thirty Years... Well, it was the opening shot of the Thirty Years' War. One of the young French soldiers in this Habsburg army laying siege to the city was the 19-year-old René Descartes, who would grow up to be the great proponent of modern French materialism. Michael Meyer, one of the last great synthesizers of the medieval alchemical vision died in the siege of the city and Frederick was killed and uh, Elizabeth fled she lived in the Hague for many years and so see in that confusion the botanist of Rudolph uh, held in his house somewhere in the suburbs of Prague the Vonich manuscript and the Thirty Years' War comes, modern times overtake Europe, and this thing drifts further and further from its roots. But my reconstruction of what must have happened is uh, that uh, in this period when Dee and Kelly were regaling Rudolph with tales of the alchemical prowess of Roger Bacon, that they... Uh, they ponied up this manuscript. Either they wrote it at that time or they had it with them. If they had it with them, it's a far more interesting story because then perhaps they are not its authors. If they are its authors, then it merely reveals the grammatical deep structure of the deranged mind of an Elizabethan magician. And this would explain to some degree why it was outside the ken of the CIA. But if they didn't write it, if they only had it in their possession, then the mystery continues because where did they get it and what was it? It is true that Dee was under the patronage of the Earl of Northumberland, who, uh, when Henry VIII broke with Rome, and all of the English monasteries were sacked by the uh, lords who stuck with the king. And uh, the Earl of Northumberland sacked monasteries that had large repositories of Bacon material. And Dee's library at Mortlake was known to have... Uh, 53 Baconian manuscripts, of which only 41 have survived into modern times. There are 41? Baconian manuscripts. Where are they? Oh, they're at the Bodleian Museum uh, Library at Oxford and the British Museum. They have all this D material. Have you seen it? No, no. Oh, well, it would be fun to see it. The most interesting thing is this huge book called A True and Faithful Relation, which is the day-by-day -day seances with these spirits as Dee and Kelly move all over Europe. It's in that that it's recorded. Oh, and this is a piece of circumstantial evidence I almost left out, that in the very month, that the emperor paid the 300 gold ducats for the manuscript. Uh, D records in his diary that they received 320 gold ducats from a mysterious source. Now, it is true that another angle on Dee's personality, and some biographers have taken the position that he didn't believe in magic at all, that he only posed as a screwball, and that actually he was uh, an intelligence agent for the British crown. He was visiting all these courts as an astrologer and a necromancer and an alchemist and actually encrypting very succinct military and strategic and diplomatic information into these letters which he was sending home. And because he could cast the finest horoscope in Europe, he had an entree into all these people's scenes. and. Uh, and the truth lies somewhere in between. He was doing all of this. He was an agent for the British crown, but he was also, you know, the finest flower of the, uh, of the medieval mind. He was used by Shakespeare as the model for Prospero in The Tempest and uh, is the model for Dr. Faustus in Christopher Marlowe's version of that classic spellbinder. <laughs> what do you think about the uh, Bacon-Shakespeare controversy? Does that fit into that at all? Well, it just shows, you know, how tenuous our grip is on what was going on in this time. I mean, besides whether Bacon wrote Shakespeare, then you have the problem of uh, things like the Vonage manuscript. Bacon visited Dean. We're now talking about uh, Francis Bacon, who was, who claimed, actually, Roger Bacon uh, as a... As one of his? As one of his, yes. He did? Oh, yes. I didn't hear that. 
that. Oh, yes. That's great. Queen Thank Elizabeth and Philip Sidney and uh, Francis Bacon visited John Dee at Mortlake one afternoon to see his library because he had more books than uh, anyone in England. One of the most interesting things about the Vonage manuscript uh, is uh, the pe people whose careers have floundered, foundered on uh, decipherments where people have come forward with very bold claims. Uh, this guy, William Romaine Newbery, Newbold, uh, in the 1920s, who was a classic scholar, a medievalist, and by all accounts, a very brilliant man, he uh, announced that he had a complete decipherment of the Vonage manuscript and um, said that what it involved was... Uh, shorthand strokes, tiny strokes that were components of each letter in the Vonage script, and that by staring through a magnifying loop, you could magnify these characters and see that encoded into each one were the distorted remains of a Roman shorthand system that had been lost for 600 years. And he produced uh, astonishing decipherments uh, in which um, he definitely thought that it was a Roger Bacon manuscript. He decoded passages that dealt with student uprisings at Oxford at Christmas time, 1292, when uh, the riot between the Black Friars and the something or other. Just, you know, long, long decipherments. The problem with all of this was that no one else could... Uh, extract the same sense using Professor Newbold's method. His method involved so many choices from pools of letters at every given point along the line that you could demonstrate that hundreds of messages could be extracted. And Professor Newbold died a broken man. He was disgraced. His career shattered. He had gone too far. The Vonich manuscript had claimed its first victim. <laughs> <laughs> the next person to advance a decipherment of the Vonich manuscript was uh, Robert S. Brumba, also of Yale University. And uh, his decipherment is in some ways almost as puzzling as the encryption. He would have us believe that the Vonich manuscript says things like, liquid Syrian matter, liquid matter, plus Syrian, Sicilian, plus Syrian, salt, European, Swedish, Sicilian, plus Syrian, plus Russian, Asian, Sicilian, salt, liquid, liquid, Asian, Italian, Syrian, salt, liquid, Sicilian, Italian, plus Sicilian, plus salt, etc., etc. Um... Robert S. Brumbaugh of Yale. However, when his method was examined by other people attempting to reproduce the same plain text, they got uh, nowhere, and it, he, uh, it can't be taken seriously. How embarrassing. Another effort at decipherment, which is minor, perhaps, in comparison to the other two, but which provides an interesting anecdote, was a man named Strong, who was at San Diego, had uh, claimed decipherment of certain of the labels of the illustrations of the Vonich manuscript. And when Paul Lee uh, formed a working group, uh, to look into the Vonich manuscript, Dr. Strong was one of the people they wanted to interview. And my friend Ralph Abraham, who's a mathematician at Santa Cruz, uh, had photostats of certain folios of the Vonich manuscript, and he sent very detailed letters to Dr. Strong with these folios as enclosures and questions like, it is alleged that on folio 9b you translated a certain word as uterus. Here is a photostat of folio 9b. Please circle the word you translated, and this kind of thing. And uh, Dr. Strong's secretary wrote Ralph back and said that he was very old, he was in his 90s, and he didn't feel he could compose a letter to address all these questions, but that if Ralph would come to San Diego, he would satisfy him completely. Uh, so that was a Thursday. Ralph made an 
got a reservation to fly down on uh, the following Monday. And Sunday night, the uh, secretary called and said that Dr. Strong had died of a heart attack that evening. So the Vonich manuscript uh, has bedeviled people's careers and... Uh, People who have claimed to understand it have uh, died with the secret untransmitted to the rest of us. The, un the intelligence community inside the United States government has spent a fair bit of time looking into it simply because it is so unusual to come upon a, such a large amount of code from such an early period and have it resist decipherment. I mean, it is just unheard of that a 16th century manuscript could not be deciphered by modern methods. The most interesting thing, in fact, published on the Vonage manuscript is uh, a United States government technical information office publication called the Vonage Manuscript, An Elegant Enigma by Mary de Imperio. And Mary de Imperio must be a Renaissance PhD student somewhere who was hired by the government to basically collate everything known about the Vonich manuscript. And uh, some interesting things are known. Eventually, I think, perhaps it will yield, although I'm not sure. For instance, computer analysis of the handwriting in it uh, shows that two hands are involved. It was written by two people. Does this mean it was written by D. and Kelly? Is this uh, the hands that we should look for? Can we then, by comparing it to the handwriting of D. and or Kelly, get a further feeling for uh, for their relationship to it? Uh, Where? How do you get a hold of one of these? You have to write to the Office of Technical Information Services in Springfield, Virginia, and ask for this particular document whose number I'll have to hunt down. And does it cost? Oh, yes. It costs like five or six dollars. But it's a wealth of information on the whole context in which, I mean, it discusses all kinds of magical alphabets and uh, early uh, systems for encoding and hiding information. I think that what fascinated me about the Vonich manuscript is above and beyond the historical puzzle, above and beyond how interesting it would be to know what it actually says, since someone went to such great effort to hide what it says, is just the idea of an unreadable book is a kind of Borgesian concept that is attractive. There must be somewhere an unreadable book and perhaps this is it, and it's almost, uh, I mean, if my analysis of it as being the product of D and Kelly has seemed too facile or facile, let me assure you that it is, and that there, not all the facts are covered by that theory. So much of D's writing is known that I think if he had been the author, it would be possible to find that out. Perhaps it is possible to find that out, and we're just premature in our wish for a resolution of it. But the unreadable book, the idea that the, the world is information, and the way by which we have cognizance of the world is by ordering all the information we come upon through relation to information that we already have accumulated. Patterns. Right. And an unreadable book in a non-English script with no dictionary attached is very puzzling because we, we are like uh, linguistic oysters. We secrete around it. We insist it into our metaphysic, but we don't know what it says, which always carries with it the possibility that uh, it says something which would unhinge our conceptions of things or that its real message is its unsayability. It simply is, uh, it points to the otherness of the nature of information. It's what's called then a limit text, as Finnegan's Wake is a limit text, or... Uh, or uh, Where does that term come from? It's a term of French structuralist uh, criticism. 
searching the search for limit text. Well, certainly the Vonich manuscript is the limit text of Western occultism. No one can read it. It is truly an occult book. <laughs> <laughs> Literal, it, it, it is like a literalizing of uh, the cartoon. the mythical book in H.P. Lovecraft's mm -hmm. work, which is the Necronomicon, the writings of the mad era of Al Hazrad. And in fact, Colin Wilson, in his book, The Philosopher's Stone, connects the Vonage manuscript to the Necronomicon. The shoe stone, maybe, too? Perhaps the shoe stone. Well, the Philosopher's Stone was the shoe stone for D, for sure. Right. Yeah. It's very interesting, this business of, uh, of uh, the angelic language in Nakian, because, as I say, 4,000 words were delivered through the showstone to D. In the 1950s, there was a famous UFO case where a woman who claimed she was in contact with UFOs taught a colonel in the CIA how to be in contact with the same group of saucers. And he was demonstrating this ability for a group of his superiors in a room in the Pentagon. And he asked for a demonstration. He was communicating with them through automatic writing. And they said, go to the window and look out. And they all went to the window and looked out. And there was a brilliant golden disk of light cruising past the Pentagon. And uh, they went berserk, uh, called the nearby Air Force Base to see what was on the scopes. The radar had just gone out in this sector, etc., etc. But what was, to tie it in with my point, <laughs> these messages uh, that this guy was getting on this Ouija board were signed AFF. Afa, which any scholar of Enochian can tell you is the Enochian word for nothingness, friends. <laughs> <laughs> Jaw dropper. So, uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting. Blake spoke with angels. He was the flower of English poetry at a certain point in time. Dee spoke with angels. He was the flower of English science and... Uh, and mechanics at a certain period and uh, perhaps the Vonich manuscript uh, is uh, actually a manuscript that is not encrypted at all but is simply uh, a book in a non-human language and therefore there is no Rosetta Stone to it it is just utterly uh, beyond the pale as they say in Ireland well I think they should analyze the ink that's one way. I really think that's a very important thing to do. Even though if it was written in the 1500s, and that would say, and, but there would also be a way to locate its its uh, origin. That's and, right. I mean, there's all sorts of approaches. In the in the uh, summation in this book by De Imperio, where she suggests things that can be done, the first thing she suggests, as being totally obvious, is the physical book should be analyzed because this has never been done. This would settle once and for all at, the, at least the century of its origin. And, you know, a number of things could be done. The libraries of the world should be searched for other examples of Vonich script. I mean, after all, are we really sure that there's no other extant example of this uh, strange writing? Uh, computer analysis, this has been part of the approach of the Santa Cruz group, is first of all settling on a standard alphabet for Vonage and then cataloging every character and the number of times it occurs and in right. what combinations with other characters. And the graphics of it as well. Just the patterns that it forms at different, if they did a, a fully uh, computer graphics on it, I bet that that would give a three-dimensional Yes, well, none of the illustrations have ever been satisfactorily interpreted. Like what are called the astrological illustrations are only nominally that. They could be anything. They just seem to have stars and circles in them, but otherwise they're not particularly relatable to the sky. The so-called pharmaceutical section, which is all these little canisters and things and these strange little naked women bathing in, these, uh, in all this plumbing, which is called the pharmaceutical or the anatomical section, uh, you know, could be anything. Could be an obscure form of central German hydrotherapy <laughs> or, uh, you know, actually the doodlings of a deranged imagination. <laughs> when you only have one of something, uh, it, it gets quite, uh, 
gets quite dicey placing it in the correct context in cultural history, especially uh, since there was a lot of secrecy in this period, a lot of people running around faking manuscripts in other people's names, using secret cover languages, uh, communicating in secret codes, plotting secret societies. I mean, this was really the breakup like of the medieval mind, just like today. All sorts of medieval mentalities. Like yes, well, this hope to establish a, an alchemical political union in Central Europe was in the context of what followed the Thirty Years and Modern Times can just be seen as one of those places where the river of history chose not to run. It was uh, Pick up a path down. not taken. But had things turned out differently, had the King of England been behind it wholeheartedly, had uh, certain things been different, it might have all uh, unraveled somewhat differently. So, what do you want to do about it? About the Vonich manuscript? Yeah. Oh, I would like to think about it. it as an object of thought. I think it's very interesting. It's like thinking about your DNA. One thing I uh, have thought to do about it is... Uh, there are now what's called psychic archaeologists, which when all else fails, you bring in these people and by various means, esoteric and exoteric, they attempt to uh, divine, it. divine what story resides in an object. Since the Vonage manuscript is at the Beneke Rare Book Room at Yale, I'm sure any serious uh, scholar would be allowed to look at it and spend time with it. Uh, I've never seen it. I would like to see it. Uh, the book which Robert Brumbaugh edited called The Most Mysterious Manuscript, which is now out of date and that his conclusions uh, cannot be taken seriously. Nevertheless, it, uh, it re reproduces a number of the folios from the manuscript. And uh, when you see them, just the pure weirdness of it all is conveyed quite readily. I mean, it is unearthly. It does not fit in the context of late medieval alchemical manuscripts or late medieval any other kind of manuscript. Does it compare other writings in there? It doesn't, but the Imperio's book does. Uh -huh. She has many magical alphabets, many different forms of shorthand and specialized note-keeping scripts that were current in Europe throughout the Middle Ages, and uh, none of them look particularly like Vonage script. Ralph Abraham made the suggestion that Vonage script had some relation to early Brahmanic number systems. He thought perhaps it was a string of numbers that would then have to be decoded from that and then further unencrypted to get sense out of. Um, one thing that might be said about it is perhaps modern people simply overrate the sophistication of our code-breaking machinery. Perhaps there are simple ways of encoding material that simply have not occurred to the CIA. And so uh, when the Vonich text is finally broken, it will be trivial the way in which it was encrypted, trivial but unexpected in some way. For instance, Ralph made the suggestion to me that uh, grids, where you have a grid which has holes in it, when laid over a page, shows you the parts of the text which are to be dealt with and all the rest of it is noise. If the grid changes from page to page and is completely irrational in the way it changes, then no computer program imaginable could separate the plain text from the noise because it isn't a recursive formula. Mm -hmm. It's an ever-changing variable that could be just whim, the whim <laughs> of how you made the grids. And this would preclude, I think, any machine-oriented effort mm -hmm. to decipher it. It would mean that it didn't want to be deciphered. It would mean that the author decided to do it that way, and, and because no one could have, at that time, deciphered it either. That's right. It would not be written. Oh, this it. grid method is known long enough that this may be the key. So that may mean that somewhere there either exist these grids or there exist the instructions for building them, mm -hmm. and then out of that you could extract a portion of Vonage text, which would quickly yield to modern methods of decipherment because it is the only part of the message which is really sensed. This is a standard uh, method of hiding a message is to 
embedded in great amounts of garbled material, hours of garbled well, material. Well, that's what alchemy is. Yes, and that's what uh, really alchemy is. it would have appealed to the alchemical imagination of Dee or Kelly or any of their educated occult contemporaries to use this kind of method. So it's very, uh, it's very interesting. What would you say the difference between an alchemist and a shaman is? Well, they have different spheres into which they project themselves. They have different models of the universe. The medieval alchemist uh, had a, uh, a discontinuous and fleeting, but nevertheless somehow ontologically founded conception of an inside and an outside. He knew that there, his ontology was naive, but he accepted the existence of an exterior world on some terms. Then it was to be manipulated through the alchemical process. Shaman actually translate into another dimension. They are true trans ecstatics. And uh, in that sense, it probably, uh, probably represents... Uh, a higher resolution of that intent. But Merciliad has traced uh, back alchemists into smithing, into early metallurgy and, the, and metalworking, which was always thought to be a magical task. And it runs together then with alchemy. Alchemy and shamanism are united in the figure of the primitive blacksmith because he is both proto-chemist and, uh, and shaman. So at that point in time, it's fused, and that's why there is so much stress on metal in primitive shamanism, on hanging metal off of your body, on smelting metal. It was like magic to turn metal red hot and to change it into weapons and figures and that sort of thing. So the Bonish manuscript would be really by an alchemist. Well, we don't know what it says. We only know the traditions in which we find it embedded. We assume it's by an alchemist. It but I could mean, anybody be... that would do that sort of a thing at that time would be labeled alchemist. Yes, it comes out of an alchemical mentality. It's very mysterious. It's quite uh, an enigma.